This week, we give our first impressions of the 2021 Chevy Suburban SUV, talk about the long-term reliability of turbocharged and direct injection vehicles, and how subscription costs are starting to creep into the automotive world, next on Talking Cars. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode. I'm John Linkove. I'm Ryan Pizlikowski. I'm Gabe Shenhar. And you know, for this week in news, we're talking about something that I think everyone has some familiarity with. It's subscription fees. Uh, you know, you're you're paying monthly on Spotify, you're paying monthly on Netflix, you're paying monthly, you know, on the, you know, you're playing Among Us or you're playing uh Roblox and you get fees, you know constantly hitting you up if you want something. Well, that's moving to cars. It's already been here, but Gabe, tell us a little bit about where the industry is going with these, you know, subscription features basically for your car. So this is not a new thing. Uh, GM had uh, OnStar service for years now, and uh, and that requires a, a monthly subscription. And uh, it, from what we understand, it's a service that uh, people, uh, particularly of uh, older demographics, appreciate because uh, the new world of digital may be uh, <clears throat> a little unfamiliar to them, and they prefer talking to a regular person. Uh, it's a, like a concierge service. Um, and, you know, uh, just like you said, I mean, we're, we've all gotten used to uh, Spotify streaming music uh, and Netflix streaming movies. And uh, the car industry wants to um, follow that as well, because uh, you buy a car and uh, then uh, you you go away for three or six years until you, you're ready for your next car. So from a business point, uh, manufacturers uh, are going to want want to keep you want to keep, keep milking you to ensure a steady stream of, of income. Well, but uh, here's where I draw the line. Hold on. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to safety, I think that shouldn't be uh, a thing. I mean, if you paid up front for uh, advanced safety features and if there is an emergency uh, uh, call notification, let's say you're in an accident, airbags deploy, and uh, the uh, SOS button in the car calls uh, first responders, that shouldn't be... Uh, uh, subject to monthly fees as well. Well, you know, you, you touch on safety and, and that's kind of a thing where so far the, um, you know, Tesla has talked about having features like that. You know, you can subscribe in, you know, you could, you could subscribe into some of their self, you know, what they are calling their, their, let's just say their autonomous, semi-autonomous, partial autonomy systems. Cadillac with Super Cruise also has that where you get a three-year free trial and then all of a sudden it may cost extra on the window sticker, you know, because of ours was was purchased, uh, our CT6 was purchased, uh, you know, a while ago. But, you know, it, it brings up some things, you know, Ryan, you know, perhaps you touch on it, uh, of either nickel and diming, but also, you know, what happens when you're the the, the next buyer, you know, the first buyer gets it, then, then what happens with a used car? Or, you know, are, why are you paying for the feature up front anyway? Yeah, so there's a lot of unknowns, right? I mean, if you 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 get this car from someone that has you know a subscription going, it, it, at some point it runs out. You have to uh, re up. Um, it is, it's a it's a it's a foreign land. I mean, when, right now when you buy a car with the stability control or whatever, it always has that. It's a hardware thing. This is, sounds like it's going to be more of a, a software thing. I, I think more to the point though for me is you know a lot of people buy cars specifically to save money. So you they buy it without all the frills because they just want a car that way to save money. But I, I don't think there's going to be a, a, a cost savings here because all these cars essentially are going to be equipped with all this extra uh, technology right. so that you can you can pay and turn these on with switches. So I don't think it's, it's not really going to help um, those people. Um, I don't I don't know. I, <laughs> I think it's important to uh, f- that uh, manufacturers are upfront with customers. So no, no, nothing should be hidden there shouldn't be any surprises and customers need to agree or not agree to it. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, BMW just uh, had uh, the wireless CarPlay uh, that they, they required uh, a monthly uh, subscription for that. And that uh, people resented that. So they uh, they backed off. Yeah, yeah that's that, that's a big example of, you know, they charge you three hundred dollars to get the feature to be able to use wireless CarPlay or CarPlay in general. And then all of a sudden charging you ninety dollars or, or charging you, excuse me, you know, per year as an additional fee. Um, right. You know, so Keith Barry, he of the, uh, you know, talking cars as well as uh, dressing like a deer, like Mike Monticello, look it up on, on YouTube. Um, 
you know, he gave a great story on consumerreports.org and, it, and it's up there. And it really talks about a, a lot of these things such as, you know, will a man, will a dealer uh, be unscrupulous and add a, a subscription in, in into you, uh, your, your car payment without telling you? Right now, it seems to be a big thing with luxury vehicles because so many of them are leased. It becomes an easy thing to just kind of throw in like, wow, well, it's another three bucks a month so you can have heated seats that work versus the heated seats that you buy in your car that aren't activated, which is the potential down the road. I think that we at Consumer Reports are worried about. Um, it also makes, it, you know, for me, it makes the, the finance and insurance guy a little bit of a, 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 you know, the next step of worry because now not only are you going to be hit up with the VIN etching and the, you know, the scotch guarding, but like, hey, why don't you add a couple more things in? So th- that that is the potential down the road. There's more information on ConsumerReports.org, a great article by Keith. And, uh, you know, check it out, write something in the comments, let us know what you think about this. Uh, with that, we're going to move over to uh, the vehicle of the week, which is a big SUV. It's the 2021 Chevrolet Suburban, uh, the big the big daddy SUV, if you will, because this is a massive truck. Um, like the Tahoe that uh, that we we initially purchased, um, it's a uh, totally redesigned. Uh, we got a 2021 four wheel drive Premier, uses the 355 horsepower 5.3 liter V8, 10 speed automatic transmission. Uh, the manufacturer suggested retail price sixty eight thousand three hundred. To that, we added the four thousand four hundred eighty five dollar premium package, which includes such niceties as panoramic sunroof, adaptive cruise control, enhanced automatic emergency braking, rear pedestrian alert, rear camera mirror and washer, head up display, a couple trailering things, trailer brake controller, hitch guidance, and trailer blind spot warning, which, which is pretty cool. Um, add in the uh, all weather floor mats for two ninety five. Destination charge, which is to me a little staggering, $1,295. And we're at a $74,375 Chevrolet Suburban. <laughs> um, it, it's a big daddy. Uh, Ryan, give us some feelings on it. I know you tow a ton with your boat. And, you know, this sounds right up your alley, even more so maybe than the Tahoe. It, um, it's, it's a little too long for me. <laughs> it's a, it's a, this thing is, is massive. I, I would like to say though, those all weather floor mats for two ninety five are worth it. <laughs> They're beautiful and they work nice. Um, now that the Suburban's, uh, another, um, near and dear one to me, my, uh, my mom had a 95 Suburban and, um, I mean, this is like an American icon vehicle. You know, I can remember so many fond memories of going to Vermont, um, skiing and, um, you know, towing. My sister had a horse. We had a horse trailer, towing the horse trailer. I mean, it, it was a do it all, um, you know, American. Uh, vehicle and <laughs> it's changed a lot. I, if I think back at the interior quality and, and just driving, um, you know, that vehicle, it was not this vehicle. This is a very refined, beautiful car. I mean, it's it's the interior is mu- a huge step up. Even in the past few generations, I think it's a major step up. It's beautiful. It's you know, it's it's smooth power. That that V8 is and it sounds glorious. I mean, we could just talk about those nice exhaust tips they leave us, the four ex- uh, quad exhaust out the rear. It's it's a beautiful vehicle, but it is massive and it's super expensive. It's become a vehicle. I think you need to really have a reason to own something like this. You know, you need to, a big family. You need to be you, you need the ability to tow. You need to have to tow. <laughs> um, it's just there's a lot of other vehicles out there that are um, potentially smaller with similar interior space. I mean, some of these unitized body uh, cars that are more car you know car like interior space is impressive. Where these body on frame vehicles are really high, the floors are up real high, and you 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 get, lose some of that um, interior space. That being said, it's still it's still enormous. But if you're not towing and really needing that truck like um, ability, um, there are other options out there. Gabe, how how is this one such a, a big improvement though? They change the suspension significantly, you know, and I mean our you know ride quality alone is 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 better, right? Yeah, so it finally enters the uh, modern era with independent rear suspension. And whereas previous Suburbans were kind of an enclosed Silverado pickup truck, this uh, Suburban is truly a flagship in terms of interior quality, in terms of the driving experience. I mean, it's super quiet. It's, uh, it feels like a luxury car. And, um, and, and you can see why the $74,000 might be justified for this ultimate uh, family vehicle and an ideal long cross-country trip uh, kind of a car. 
One thing I'd say though that uh, is really important is we got the premiere. The premiere comes with uh, uh, GM's uh, magnetic ride control, which uh, does wonders for steadying the the vehicle. It's uh, it makes the ride more composed. It makes the handling more responsive. And compared to the Tahoe, that uh, where we don't have the uh, that kind of suspension, it makes a difference. One thing uh, that uh, we can't not mention is the uh, electronic uh, gear selector, which uh, is you know requires some getting used to. It's hard to do uh, parking maneuvers, reverse drive, uh, reverse drive uh, without looking. That's a bit of a pain. And of course, it's a tall vehicle, and it takes uh, a little bit of a climb to get in. And another thing, I, I took the, the Suburban to Brooklyn and that tall hood um, <laughs> blocks uh, your view. I mean, it can block um, pedestrians easily, so it becomes uh, quite a liability to have such a big vehicle in an urban setting. You, you know, you, you touch on the hood and it, it really is a thing. I mean, standing in the garage at, at work with uh, with Chris Jones, one of our techs uh, at, at the test center, and... You're looking at these things, and I mean, they're massive. I'm six feet tall, and it feels almost as if it's up to my head. Um, I couldn't imagine doing service on that. You know, it's it's it seems like, you know, you're going to need, uh, you know, carts to, you know, to surround the vehicle. And so uh, a tech will have to step up, you know, two or three steps just to start getting in there, which which is nuts, um, just to do some some simple fluid changes, you know, just to fill it. I, I agree, Ryan. I, I went to high school in a carpool that uh, someone had a Suburban and it was just a rough and ready vehicle. And it was the Suburban was its roots was it was a truck. It wasn't a luxury vehicle. And today, you know, these the Suburban, the Yukon XL, they, they get to this this point of people I know say, well, I might look at a Range Rover or I'll look at the Suburban or the Tahoe. You know, they don't even consider the, the Escalade, which is the Cadillac Escalade, which is coming and is going to be, you know, crazy expensive and crazy luxurious with the same, you know, with similar capabilities. Um, you know, it, it is, it's surprising, you know, you, you, you can get a rough, you know, much more lower, lower price one. Um, that's, you know, a little more of a, of a, of a work, work truck type, but it, it's a steady vehicle. It, it drives really nicely, but driving it around town is really hard. And, and like you alluded to, Ryan, like you mentioned, uh, you know, it's so big now that you really do need it, like a five or six person family, huge towing, you know, because there are so many three row SUVs that can that can fit a, 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 a five person family, you know, even even a six person family, you know, for day to day operation. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have some information on the Suburban on ConsumerReports.org. It's in our test program. So check back to another episode uh, for our final final findings on it. We wanted to take a quick second to tell you about a new initiative we're introducing on the podcast, which is our Talking Cars donation program. For those of you that don't know, Consumer Reports is a nonprofit organization, and we're able to do all of the work we do, including anonymously buying our test cars and producing this show through memberships to our website and magazine, as well as through donations. What the Talking Cars donation program will do is allow loyal Talking Cars fans to support the show, assist in supporting the costs of producing the podcast, as well as support all of the work CR does to keep consumers safe. You'll be able to contribute either as a one-time donation or on a monthly basis. Even $5 a month really helps. Go to CR.org slash give talking cars and find out more. And with that, we're going to move over to the question and answer part of the show. Keep them coming. Talking cards at iCloud.com. Send videos, send uh, text questions. You know, we love them. We go through them. We, we need a, you know, a, a big bench of questions so we can do some uh, all question shows coming up soon. Um, so for this one, we're going to start out with a question. Alex from Montreal, a video question. Roll it. Hi, Talking Cars. A famous YouTube car mechanic says to avoid cars with turbos, direct fuel injection, all-wheel drive, and hybrid engines. He says the repairs can be really expensive. So what do you think? If I want to buy a new car that's going to last 15 to 20 years like my old CRV, should I avoid these technologies? Thanks a lot. So... Is it possible, Gabe, to avoid new technology, uh, you know, when when in in a car? It's really hard these days uh, when you buy a new car to not have a a turbo engine or uh, any of the uh, new technologies that uh, 
are used to maximize fuel economy. But um, uh, what we're finding that it's not really technology based. Uh, the reliability indicator is more tied into a brand. And uh, if you look at uh, Toyota hybrids, for instance, we know that uh, they can go uh, half a million miles uh, with just needing oil changes and tire changes pretty much. And um, so it's, it's more about who makes the car, who makes the technology, and uh, not so much uh, about the technology itself. Ryan, how this is this has been something that, you know people have talked about for years, right? I mean, you know, the whole like, oh, I, I got to get something much older. It's much simpler. It's much better. But is it really? <laughs> so I mean, if it's it is a fact of uh, I guess nature, right? I mean, the more complicated something is, the more the big greater chance for um, you know things to go wrong, right? You know, we touched on it before. It's hard to find vehicles like this. You know, simpler vehicles because we're you know we're just pushing through time with more and more complicated vehicles. They're more complicated, but they're safer. I think people forget too, though, is some of these older vehicles that went a million miles. It didn't do that without proper maintenance. It didn't do that without some issues. I mean, let's face it. In general, if you maintain an, uh, a modern engine and uh, vehicle, it's going to go a long ways. Um, you can't neglect it. You know, like Gabe said too, if you check our, you know, pay attention to the reliability um, data and things that we we can provide. You can weed through. I mean, there are cars out there that are not as reliable or will not last as long. It's something to um, pay attention to. Yeah, like you said, I think about the talk about fuel economy and, and people saying, "Oh, well, they they should build that Honda CRX because that got forty plus miles per gallon and the thing weighed." You know, it was like a paper mache vehicle compared to today's cars. You know, it right, doesn't right. have the safety features and the convenience features. And they, they still had things that broke, like you said. So very interesting question. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, our next one comes from Kevin from Harrisburg, Virginia. And he says, my wife and I recently won a raffle where we get to choose a Toyota vehicle up to $34,000 as the grand prize. We are an all EV household and are planning on selling whichever vehicle we select to maximize our prize value. Which model and trim would you recommend us choosing? So I'm going to throw this to Ryan first to shake things up. What do you What do you, <laughs> would, you got for us? Um, so this is kind of an interesting question, right? I mean, um, you know, if it if he wants to maximize the value, um, the good news is it's already a Toyota, so that's a good thing. You want to pick something that's popular, obviously. You know, there's a few things that you have to think about too. I don't know if this includes, um, you know, the taxes and the fees or how that all works out. But if you're gonna, if they're gonna go ahead and get a vehicle and then try to sell it, I would grab a Tacoma. Find a Tacoma that's um, right around that, you know, price range. Um, depending on all those uh, unknowns of the taxes and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, Tacoma super popular and it holds its value, even if you kept it for a year or two. That's a good point. That's right. a good point, Gabe. What do you think? Yeah, I did some homework for for this guy, and uh, with the Tacoma SR uh, extended cab, not the crew cab, with a V6 and four wheel drive, you slide it in right under that thirty four thousand uh, dollar uh, threshold, and 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 the Tacoma is known for holding its value uh, beautifully. Yeah, I, it scary. We we all agree. I mean, you know, I, I looked at the Tacoma too, just in the sense of you know Harrisonburg, Virginia. You know, you're gonna be you know there's an outdoorsy element to that. I mean, you especially if he doesn't want to do something where he kind of has a maybe takes a bias of liking EVs and, and more green vehicles. You know, you could you could find a Rav Four. I don't think a hybrid. You know, you you can go in that route just because it's a super popular vehicle. Um, but again, my question was also with taxes and, and fees and what you have to pay and sale. You know, you have to pay sales tax. You have to do you have to register it and then immediately sell it. Um, Some sometimes raffles like that they actually allow they though there's an offer of uh, just a, a cash value of maybe a little. It might be a little less than that thirty four, um, but it might actually work out as a wash. Um, right. You know, in the less hassle of you having to acquire this vehicle and then get rid of it you know well and especially and you know it, we're lengthening the question but yeah i want to throw this to gabe especially with covid you know selling a car now not necessarily something everyone's going to be comfortable doing i mean gabe you went through selling a, a used vehicle right and you, you know that you put some restrictions on on how to do that right uh you know, i just sold my in-laws bmw 5 series and uh i said uh, to people up front uh look i'm not going to get in the car with you for a test drive uh you're not going to drive the car uh, by yourself without me so uh that's uh, the way it's going to be contactless uh and, uh, and and people you know some people said okay best of luck bye uh, uh <laughs> and some people were were okay with it so yeah 
So good luck, Kevin. Let us know what happens, especially if they have that, that cash option. That would be, that'd be pretty cool. Um, our next question comes from Rick from Chesapeake, Virginia, who says, having the storage space for a second set of tires is great if you can do it. However, this is not a reality for everyone. If space is an issue, what are the best options for storing a tire to avoid creating flat spots? On its side on the floor, upright with one point of contact on the ground, or how it used to be done in the old days, tying a rope around the tire and suspending it from a beam in your garage. <laughs> Ryan, our, our tire tire expert extraordinaire, what, do, what have you got for us on this one? Um, so, yeah, if, uh, great question. And he's, he's right. I mean, a lot of people um, are, you know, they, they have this issue. Where do you, I store these tires? Um, you know, the, there's a little unknown here. I'm not sure if these tires are mounted or unmounted when he's taking them off. Um, you know, some people have a whole other set of wheels. So they have the tires mounted on the wheels and they pull that wheel off. They put the next one on and, as a package, right? Some people actually go through the um, trouble of having them dismounted because they didn't want to you know, maybe spend the extra money for the wheels, the extra set of wheels. In either case, um, you know, we store tires in our tire building when we're testing and we've had tires in there for years, actually, um, on their side, stacked up, uh, four high. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, when, if there's not mounted on wheels, there is a, there is a potential for them to, they kind of crunch together a little bit and that bottom, those bottom tires, actually the beads will actually get a little closer together. Not bad, but when they go to mount them the next time around, they might have a little trouble um, get the blasting of the beads out because they're so narrow and there's so much air escaping. Maybe not something to even worry about. Flat spotting on modern tires, especially off of the vehicle, not an issue either. You know, if you have four random places in your garage you could stick these tires and that's what fits, uh, go for it. The big thing about storing tires is keeping them out of sunlight and just the weather. That's what, you know, degrades rubber over time. You know, <laughs> you could dangle them from your beams if that uh, works for you. You know, the only thing that I would actually say not to do is stack a bunch of stuff on top of them. If you do stack them in a pile, don't use it as a table. Um, you know, the sidewalls are more delicate than the uh, tread area um, areas. So, um, you know, a puncture or something wouldn't be good. You don't want any sharp objects or heavy weight on them. So no no covering them in a tarp and putting them outside, but also no convincing your, uh, your, your partner that a coffee table of tire base <laughs> would be good. It sounds uh, like. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. I, I would, I would keep them inside if you can. Absolutely. I mean, if you have to put them outside, um, definitely cover them, absolutely cover them with a tarp or something. Um, they sell little covers for tires like that. Um, and that, those covers are even good to use indoors. Excellent. Excellent. Well, let us know, Rick. Take a take a photo of your uh, your final tire solution and uh, and tell us uh, you know your your final setup of your tires and let us know uh, what happens with it because it'll be pr- pretty interesting to see see what you do. I remember doing that and uh, you know one of the reasons we found a house with a basement was we wanted to store track tires and uh, winter tires and all that stuff. So our last question comes from Gil and Gil says, "I'm always so impressed by the Mazda MX-5 Miata. I would like to lease or buy one with a manual transmission, but I've never driven a manual." I think I know the basic idea, but do you have any suggestions on how to learn? Do you think a dealer would let me try to drive it? Or should I bring a friend who already has experience with a manual? Gabe, so at Shenhar Automotive uh, and Gil shows up wanting to drive a Miata without uh, knowing how to drive a manual, what do you think? You're going to let him out? Gil, with all due respect, uh, if you told me you get the basic idea of swimming, I'm not going to throw you in the pool and, uh, <laughs> and see what happens. So, uh, no. Um, Learning how to drive a manual is not something you do by correspondence or uh, watching a YouTube video. I have a little bit of experience with that. Uh, I, I taught my wife how to drive a manual and we're still married and my kids how to drive a manual. Uh, years ago, um, a, a friend's son told me, oh, I, I, I've driven manual before. And uh, so, okay, I said, let's go. And uh, at the first traffic light, we stalled, and uh, as uh, traffic uh, mounted behind us, I had to get out of the car and apologize to people. I'm sorry, new driver. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's no such thing as knowing the the, uh, the basic idea of driving a manual. There is an art and, and science to it and practice. Uh, so uh, you better find a, a friend that uh, that will be nice enough to let you uh, practice on, on their car. Yeah, I, w- I would say the dealer is not going to let you do that or – the minute you have some stalls, unfortunately, they're going to probably want to run you out of the dealership and they won't, you know, they, they just are going to worry about damage. Um, you're not going to destroy the car with a couple stalls, a hard stalls, but, you know, they're not going to do that. So I would certainly bring a friend. Um, you know, if you're looking by a used one, it, it the clutch is already worn, depending on how old the car is. You know, maybe the, the, the person selling it would let you because with knowledge, like you're going to have to replace a clutch anyway soon. So you might as well just kind of bang through it. But that could be expensive with the gearbox. I had a similar situation. 
drove from Washington, D.C. to Florida. Somewhere in Georgia, we pulled off. I said, I'm beat. You know, my car's a manual. I let my co-driver who said he could drive it drive. We didn't make it down the on-ramp to the, you know, from the rest stop. <laughs> and I had a, we had to pull over to the side because we were, <laughs> you know, bucking, bucking like a Bronco down there. So, Ryan, you know, your, your thoughts on it? Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's... It, like Gabe said, there's it, uh, um, there's a lot of feel to it. That's that's how you learn. You have to you have to you have to do it right. You're not going to ruin a car um, unless you do something real crazy. You know, and you also want to avoid that situation where you, you you do if you went to a dealer and they somehow let you drive it and you you do have trouble. You want to get away, not have that bad experience, right? Because then it's gonna it's gonna live with you forever. You know, um, and you know you lose some confidence and whatnot. Um, but you know you want to be with if you could find a friend. Um, that has a car like this. Unfortunately, in, in these times of COVID, um, you know, you you don't want to just jump in a car with anybody. Otherwise, I'd say you could actually put a, you know, if you could put a listing on F- Facebook Marketplace or something looking for, you know, willing to pay someone to help um, let me drive their car or something. But right now, that's not a good time to do that. Yeah, I, I would think even renting a car would be a challenge to find a rental that's an automatic. That's not an automatic. Um, you know, one benefit is Clutches are pretty easy and light today these days. You know, this isn't a spring clutch, you know, a heavy clutch from the 60s, 70s, even the 80s. Some of these cars had, you know, some 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 heavy clutches. So, you know, a, a good day, you know, you could get the friction point. You could learn the feel of friction point and, and there'll be some gear grinds. But, um, you know, just find a really good friend and, you know, offer him a couple of meals or, or something <laughs> else. So, but... With that, we're going to wrap up this week's episode. Thanks for watching. As always, send us your questions, text, video, talkingcars at iCloud.com. Check the show notes below for more information on what we talked about. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.